Thank you, uh, Jim and Mike Rugeri for inviting me. Thank you for all that you do for the field. And this new publication of the Aslander is really great. And uh, it's just what we need, uh, the sort of the bringing together of the, it's like the old Maya meetings at Texas where we brought together the, uh, the academics with the non-academics and everybody had something to share and everybody mm -hmm. felt a part of the excitement of the field. That's what, what we want to continue, I think, and and uh, and you 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 and uh, Jim and Jim Reed and Mike Ruggeri really deserve a lot of credit for this. And I also want to mention Joel Skidmore. Uh, he's been doing this for a hundred years already, and uh, he's and just out of the goodness of his heart, you know, he's uh, putting out these incredible publications and and the journal, the Pari journal and whatnot, it just deserves enormous credit because they're doing it just because they love it, not because of any, uh, not because it's gonna be on their resume or they're looking for an advanced position at some academic institution, you know? So kudos to all of you and anyone else I didn't mention, I apologize, but those come to mind right now. Uh, the topic today, uh, Glyphs at Chichen Itza, Outside the Maya Tradition. I struggled with the title a long time, uh, working with Peter Schmidt on this. Um, he came up with the title uh, in Spanish, Glyphos at Chichen Itza, Ajenas de la tra Tradición Maya, Outside of the Maya Tradition, because you can't really say they're non-Maya glyphs, although that's the term I use for shorthand. I say the non Maya glyphs catalog, but we really don't know for sure. And we'll get to this at the end of the talk. I hope you know a discussion about what is it, what does the presence of these glyphs mean? What can we infer from their presence? Because if the Maya themselves decided to start using glyphs that were not in their traditional system, but that they borrowed from the or they borrowed conceptually from Western Mesoamerica, then they're still Maya glyphs because the Mayas are the ones who invented them and used them and put them out there and carved them on the monuments for all to see. So they are still Maya glyphs in that sense. So more accurately in saying non-Maya glyphs would be glyphs outside the Maya tradition, the traditional classic Maya uh, hieroglyphic writing. So Chichen Itza, is, now I'm pressing my arrow to go to the next slide and it's not going. So we've already got to our first glitch there. I'll press that arrow over there. Okay, so Chichen Itza is probably one of the most visited sites in the world. Uh, on, during the high season, it gets over 3000 visitors a day pre-COVID. 3,000 a day. Uh, and this iconic building is probably one of the most recognized buildings in the world. So, uh, but it's amazing how much debate there still rages over Chichen and, and, and uh, its occupants. Um, Going back over a hundred years, over a hundred and twenty some years, to uh, Maudsley's work at Chichen, we've known about the Maya glyphs. I mean, the uh, non-Maya glyphs, or the the glyphs that are not in the tradition of the ancient Maya. And this, uh, these drawings by Annie Hunter and boy, are these ever great drawings. I mean, the detail is magnificent. She, uh, I'd like to see a biography of her sometime. Maybe there is one, I don't know. Maybe uh, it's in the, anyway, we won't go on sidetrack. So this, this is an example of the glyphs that we're talking about. Uh, they usually occur above and in front of the person, but not always. Sometimes they're behind the person, but generally speaking, they're above and in front of the person. 
And they're generally about the size of the shoulders and head of the person, generally speaking. Later in the 20th, early 20th century, the Carnegie Institution of Washington's extensive work at Chichen produced more examples, especially Jean Charlot's uh, renderings, illustrations of the bas reliefs from the Temple of the Warriors cluster. The Temple of Warriors clusters include, now can you see my cursor going round and around? Yes. Yes, okay. So this is a Temple of the Warriors here. This down here is the Northwest Colonnade. This over here is the Northeast Colonnade. And underneath the Temple of the Warriors is the Temple of the Chakmul. And we'll, I'll take you down there and show you that also. So this is what uh, Charlotte is referring to as the Temple of the Warriors cluster, all these taken together. And this is an example of his pastel watercolors that uh, was published, it was published in uh, Morris, Charlotte and Morris, 1931. And here's Ten Rabbit, one of the few glyphs that we can actually read. Although again, we don't know what language it's in. We don't know if this is in Mayan or in Nahuatl or Chontal, we, we just don't know. But anyway, here we have Ten Rabbit, one of the clearer examples of, of glyphs in this style. And in that publication of uh, Morris, Charlo and Morris, he illustrates, he, he compiles this, this group of images for the, uh, for the glyphs that, that, that were known at that time, but it's not a complete list. It's not a complete catalog. And he groups them, and it's tempting to do so probably, he groups them into themes like birds down here, uh, up here, objects. So we have birds versus objects, and then miscellaneous animal representations. But he refers to them as name glyphs, and that's something that we need to talk about too, is are they name glyphs? Um, it's different uh, researchers have different opinions about that. Are they naming the individuals or are they, could they have something to do with the rank of the individual or could they have something to do with the place of origin as such as in toponyms or as uh, Mark Zender has mentioned in the, uh, like the Tizoc stone they're they're like, they're not really toponyms so much as they are their ethnic identity, the ethnic identity of the person. So there's different possibilities of how, of what these glyphs are. And I'll, if, well, I'll give you my opinion right now. Uh, why not? Since I have the floor, <laughs> I can give you my opinion. Uh, I think they have to be name glyphs because there are so many and they do not repeat. There's over 250 examples of these glyphs now at Chichen, and only less than one handful repeat, or maybe only two or three actually repeat. So there can't possibly be 250 different ranks or 250 different ethnic identities. There could possibly be 250 different toponyms but I think it makes, you know, uh, Occam's razor, it makes more sense just to, to think that they are, they're naming the individual that they, that they appear with. Then later in the, uh, this is, uh, the Carnegie publication on the Mercado, the Mercado at Chichen Itza, Carl Rupert's excellent publication. We see where that's located and Rupert's map. The dais there, or the bench as it's called, there are numerous examples of these uh, glyphs in the Western Mesoamerican style. Here's uh, 
Proskuritas incredible uh, rendering, a restoration illustration of the dais, that's the bench, and the jam. And this is what it might have looked like around uh, 1000 AD. And here is the publication by uh, drawings by William Lincoln in Rupert 1943 with his watercolors above and his line drawing below showing captives with these, uh, I'll go ahead and say non Maya glyphs because it's just shorthand. Here's a close up example of, the, of a figure with the glyph in front of his forehead in the standard format. And then here's his line drawing of the same. And he has a rope tied to his hands. His hands are bound. I'll back up a little so you can see in the bottom drawing, you see clearly the rope connecting the prisoner's hands, their tied wrists. And then there's a figure in the center, a sacrificial scene, a figure in the center and then the figures on the right are facing him to the left. And they also have their, their glyphs in front of them. So I think it's interesting that the prisoners are high enough status and high enough rank that they have their own name glyphs. So the prisoners themselves seem to be rather elite figures, worthy at least of being named in the in the in the glyphic writing that's something to keep in mind and then th these are compiled in the uh, rupert publication and these are really excellent drawings and there's a compilation of those so what i'm doing at this in this early part of my presentation is showing what we already know what we've already known. Tazer's uh, work, 1957, Chichen Itza and Cenote of Sacrifice, gives a very, very brief, uh, whoops, sorry, gives a very, very uh, small sample of, of the drawings based on Maudsley. And the last two are probably not even glyphs. Well, the last one for sure is iconography. It's not a glyph, it's iconography. The second and the last one might be iconography and it might be a glyph. And I've included that actually in the glyph catalog. So I might be criticized for including iconography as a glyph or mis misinterpreting it, but I wasn't sure. So I went ahead and included it. So anyway, and the rest are taken directly from, from Maudsley. But uh, Tazer gives a, gives a uh, listing, a num enumeration of, of glyphs, and he separates them into Toltec and Maya. And I don't think very many people these days uh, go along with Tazer's um, identification of the figures in the, he, he would identify the figures like in the upper temple of Jaguar murals as being either Toltec or Maya based on their appearance. And uh, doesn't seem to be holding up very well. So take these numbers with a grain of salt. Plus the numbers don't really match. With, I took, uh, I went with Charlot's renderings and Morris, Charlot and Morris and counted the total number of glyphs that appear in that publication. And the numbers don't match these numbers. So. Anyway, this is just to give you an idea of what we have, or what we had up to, and for some reason, this is not showing all on my screen. Uh, in 2010, and I'm not sure how to get this thing out of, off my screen up there. I've got all these icons, these chat, share, pause, annotate, showing up and covering part of my picture. Oh, well. So in 2010, we had the following numbers, about 140. Uh, 
non-Mayid lists that were published in academic publications. And today we have almost double that number. So that's basically what I'm going to be showing you is, is uh, how what, we've, what we're presenting is a contribution to the field in the sense that we're, we systematically reviewed what's already known and then added to it. So back 10 years ago, Peter Schmidt and I embarked on this little project and produced this preliminary catalog of glyphs outside the Maya tradition at Chichen Itza. And I um, presented this catalog at a couple of different uh, professional meetings at the, uh, at the Mayistas meeting in Merida that UNAM puts on bi biannually, and also at, in Guatemala City at the uh, Arqueología meetings there. And then I also uh, gave copies, uh, you know, digital copies to whoever showed an interest. And so this catalog has been out there for 10 years. And then more recently, uh, Megan Rubenstein and I have uh, assembled a revised and updated version uh, 10 years later on the anniversary of the first one, a catalog of non Maya glyphs at Chichen Itza assembled by Bruce Love and Megan Rubenstein. And this is available at brucelove.com. It's very, very simple to find and to download or use online. And to do this, um, we organized it according to buildings, the glyphs according to which building they were on. And we came up with this essentially going from, roughly going from the north to the south, from the north ball court temple as the first building, all the way down to the principal group of the Southwest and the Atlantean columns at the south of the site. Here's the uh, catalog as it appears online in Megan's and my uh, blog, Contributions to Mesoamerican Studies. And I wanna plug that. And I also wanna encourage any of you with an interest in doing so to submit contributions for Megan and I to review and to uh, see if perhaps we would like to publish your contribution. We have on this website, we have two types of contributions. We have the cor corpus volumes, which you see here, past corpus volumes. And this has to do with hieroglyphic inscriptions, which we, where we do it in the, in the old, uh, uh, the uh, corpus, pro the, the old uh, Harvard Peabody corpus format of photographs and drawings side by side. And that's what the corpus volumes are. No interpretation, no readings, no nothing, just photographs and drawings side by side as, as in Ian Graham. And then the, the research contributions is, are then like articles or, or uh, and they can be of any size, any range from two or three pages up to full length articles. So please uh, feel free to contribute to, to me or to Megan anytime. And so the thing that impressed me most when I compiled the, uh, the list of the buildings was how widespread these glyphs are. I had thought they were just mostly, you know, the ball court and uh, the warriors temple complex, but it turns out they're all over Chichen Itza from the farthest north to the farthest south, not the farthest south, but to the south. And so that's really impressive. And um, these are really, really widespread and need to be known by the people in our field. It needs, to, it needs to be acknowledged how widespread these are, how ubiquitous they are. And so here's a, more of a close up of the central area of the site. So we have North Temple at the ball court, Upper Temple of Jaguars, Lower Temple of Jaguars, South Temple. Then we have the Temple of the Warriors, 
the Northwest Colonnade, the Temple of the Chak Mool, the uh, Northwest Colonnade Deus, and the Northeast Colonnade, and the Temple of the Sculpted Columns, and the Mercado, and the Stolok Temple, and the Osario. All those have examples of non Maya glyphs, <clears throat> which of course accompanies the iconography, the, the so called Toltec iconography or the Western Mesoamerican icon iconography, the warriors, the figures, the priests, uh, the, uh, and all, all that, which is well known and has been known for a century. So, starting with the North Temple of the Ball Court. We have the west column, the east column is very interesting right off the bat. We have, these are drawings by Linda Sheely in her uh, Sheely and Matthews volume. And there we have these glyphs, which are actually quite well known from uh, central Mexico. The, uh, the one on the right being called the reptile eye. And uh, what's most interesting about these is, is pointed out, and as far as I know, Linda and Peter were the first to point out, but I, I may be wrong about this, that these two figures actually appear in two places. They appear here and in the lower temple of the Jaguars. And these exact same figures appear here with the exact same glyphs. And you can, and not only that, they have the same iconography. So you see the figure on the left with a straight rod in his hand and the figure on the right with his serpent staff. And if we go back to the North Temple, the figure on the left has a serpent staff with the same name glyph, and the figure on the right has a long staff, the straight staff. Those are the exact same figures with the same accoutrements, same iconography. And look at that long necklace, that long necklace with the mask hanging from it. Same things here. So that's the same figure. But this is rare indeed. We do not find the same figures and the same glyphs repeated uh, in other places at Chichen Itza. And here's a photograph from 2019, just showing the uh, present condition of the back wall. I was, uh, you know, really honored to have the permission to photograph these. Uh, uh, night for nighttime photography. So this shows, especially the reptile eye, you can barely make out. So it just shows how valuable these early drawings are. These early drawings are priceless because these things are wearing away. Look at their feet. I mean, their, their sandals, their shoes, the, they're all, it's almost completely gone uh, just from the moisture and the eroding, the limestone eroding away over time. So we should, we should thank our lucky stars for these early researchers who produced this data. And, th and that's what I'm all, all, the only thing I'm trying to do and Megan and I are trying to do here is just, just produce data so that it's out there for people to use. I mean, George Stewart, uh, rest his soul, encouraged me, he says, just produce data. Let other people argue about the data, but just, if you really wanna do something valuable, produce the data. And so that's, that's what we're doing here. And then other people can discuss it all they want forever. You know, what does it all mean? And then, okay, so moving on, what a lot of people don't realize, and what I certainly didn't realize for a long time, was that inside the lower temple of Jaguars, on the west, excuse me, on the east vault. So if you walk in, and turn around and face east and look up, there's a whole carved panel there that Maudsley did not record. And that the only recording of it up until recently was Merle Green Robertson, bless her soul. And may she rest in peace. Her, she did rubbings of that entire upper vault. And again, we have figures. Look, here's a figure leaning forward. Here, there's his nose and his mouth, he's leaning forward, grasping the darts, the atlatl darts in his left hand. And there is his name glyph, the Jaguar. 
And then the next figure over here, again, leaning forward with the atlatl darts in his hand. And this is his name glyph, perhaps a bowl or a saucer, hard to know for sure. But Merle did this uh, way back in the, in the 90s. And she put these out in that, I remember getting this five uh, CD or DVD, five, a set of five, I think it was five DVDs with her glyphs or with her rubbings, excuse me, with her rubbings. And that's where I got these images from for the catalog, was from those DVDs that Merle and Joel put out 30 some years ago. And thank you all for that because they're the high resolution and they're wonderful. And as, as I'll point out again, I think if I remember to, there are details in Merle's rubbings that are not in the drawings and watercolors of Charlot and others. And uh, Merle's rubbings, I think, are highly underrated. They are really, really valuable resource. This is a current photograph of the entire nor uh, Western, excuse me, Eastern, the entire Eastern vault. And I'll show close ups because it's hard to make out anything and from this, just to show you what the whole vault, you can see the, over here on the left, this kind of diagonal line, that's the, the slope of the vault going upward. And then these are my, that was my photographs from 2019, from standing inside there and shooting up. And then the drawing I made after, after that, after I got back home, you can see those two registers of figures, the upper register here and the lower register here. These are not captives, these are, these are warriors. They all have uh, atlatls and darts and they all have name glyphs. And here's a close up of them. There's a photograph above and that's the actual color that is still there on the wall up above and there's a drawing below. So here's three figures, the figure on the left, the face is gone, but you can see a glyph up here, who knows what it is. Figure in the center, the face is gone. In his right hand is the atlato, which is a weird shape here, but that's the shape it is in the photograph. You can see the photograph up here. And then the darts in the left hand, and then the feathers and the headdress, and then here's his name glyph. And then over here on the right, another with the butterfly pectoral with the hallmark of the Toltec or Central Mexican uh, warriors, the atlatl darts and the name glyph, perhaps a bird. It looks like a bird, a lot of bird glyphs. So here's, here's the glyphs. So moving forward, moving on, the upper temple of jaguars, which Modley produced, Here's Annie Hunter's drawings. Uh, interesting here, when you have doubled glyphs, <clears throat> that suggests phoneticism. It suggests uh, if that's a feather, if that was, those are feathers, perhaps uh, kook or kook -ku. I mean, it's a guest. Uh, or it could be in Nahuatl, you know, whatever the word for feather is in Nahuatl, we don't know. The North, the South Temple, where the White Arrow is, has this rather famous collocation. Again, Merle's rubbings that uh, that Linda and Peter pointed out, and others have could be Khan Ek, because Khan Ek is a well-known Maya name, and Khan for snake and Ek for star. This could be very well be Khan Ek. But it could also be in Nahuatl, uh, whatever the word for star and snake in Nahuatl. Co it could be Coat star. And then uh, moving forward, now I'll get, take you down. And uh, those of you who haven't had a chance to get down into the Chakmul Temple, it's quite an adventure. It's, it's exciting to get down in there. This is the entrance that was built by the Carnegie Project. 
preserved by them. They exposed the Chakmul temple and they preserved beautifully, preserved the pillars with their painted uh, reliefs. And then they enclosed the whole thing in the warrior's temple, preserving them and, uh, and created a staircase down to get down there, which one can, can access today. And this is the stairway going down into the Chakmul temple. And here's what it looks like inside. And these columns do not have non-maya glyphs on them, but there was a bench on the south side. And here's Charlot's watercolor of the bench that does have glyphs. And here is an example in the center of one of the glyphs, a seated figure that appears in front of a seated figure. The seated figure is the glyph in front of a seated figure holding a snake staff here. And there's a, quite, there's a number of these which are in, now in the catalog. And these are no, these no longer exist. This, the bench is gone, the watercolors are gone. The, it's all gone. The only thing we have is Charlot's drawings and probably uh, Carnegie photographs that have not been published that are in the archives at Peabody. But I haven't looked for those, so I don't know. And then the Warriors Temple itself, we have Charlotte's watercolors and line drawings. There we have the 10 rabbit example. And then the Northwest Colonnade Dais, which is the bench, has a few. Here's a, a plan drawing of the dais. And then this one is if this top one is iffy because there is some iconography that looks like this, but I went ahead and included it. Uh, there's uh, Charlotte's drawing and then Merle's rubbing of the same thing. The thing is it's in the exact location where these glyphs appear. So I went ahead and included it uh, at the risk of being criticized for including iconography. There are other cases where this same form appears where it looks more like it's just like a scroll or a flame or something, iconography. But I went ahead and included it in this case. Uh, Northwest Colonnade outlined here. And this, these are Charlotte's drawings. And these, we have Merle's rubbings for many of them, but not all of them. <clears throat> but we really need photographs and new drawings. So, I mean, there's a, a year's worth of work left to do on the, just on these uh, glyphs alone uh, to get night photography and then drawings to really update the catalog. There's a good doctoral dissertation there for someone maybe. The Northeast Colonnade, again, not yet uh, published in full. I like this one, a very interesting one. This was published by Oliver Ricketson. Uh, then the, the uh, in the group of the thousand columns on the Eastern side, there's a temple of the sculpted columns. And Peter Schmidt restored these columns <coughs> to their to their current state. These were fallen, these drums of carved stone, these circular drums of these uh, columns were fallen. And Peter, bless his soul, uh, restored all these with, with winches and hoists and, and block and tackle and chains. And he lifted them into place and, and cemented them back into place. And then, um, I was honored to have the permission to get in and to photograph them. These, these are their numbers. And you'll notice that most of them are columns, but there are some jams. 21, 22, 23, and 24 are jams on the end of walls and not columns. So I'll show you those examples too. And not all have glyphs. I, because of a uh, limited time, I only photographed the columns with the glyphs, 
with figures with glyphs. And it's a shame that I couldn't photograph every column and every side. Uh, but limited budget, limited time, we do what we can. But anyway, we have, uh, prior to the photographs, we had Merle's rubbings, which are excellent again. And we had Guillermo Cowell's field drawings. Memo Cowell is really an unsung hero also. He was Peter Schmidt's field illustrator and not being trained in Maya uh, art history or Maya studies at all, being basically a milpero from Santa Elena who was hired on at, as a worker and then showed an inclination for illustration. And Peter, you know, uh, brought him on as a, as a field illustrator for Peter's project. And these are his drawings <clears throat> of these uh, columns. So you see this interesting dog figure. It's a dog, but what kind of leg, what he has for legs, uh, uh, very interesting, open for speculation, just what's going on there. And then here is the photograph and drawings from 2019. So we now have good high resolution photographs and drawings of all the figures with inscriptions, with the, the non mitre glyphs. And there's a close up, the photograph above and the drawing below. And then again, here's Merle's rubbing and Memo Kowal's uh, drawings. And then the photograph, the Love's photograph and Love's drawings. And so we have that for all the uh, figures with inscriptions. Here's one with numbers, but most of them are just objects In many of them are partially erased, difficult to see what they are. The stars, easy to see. Interesting objects, very interesting. So we have this new data, and this is new to the catalog, you know. So that's an important contribution, I, I believe. The seated figure is interesting because the, one of the Tula glyphs has a seated figure like this. So this kind of matches one of the Tula glyphs. And these are the jams. The jams, they have figures, they're narrower because they're not, they're not round columns, they just have a flat face. They, they're holding up the uh, roof, the beams that support the roof. And between their hands are the glyphs, in this case, uh, on the left side and the right side. So that's it for the sculpted columns. And now to the Mercado, it's Carnegie photograph of the Mercado. Here's a dais here, reconstructed by them. Oh, <laughs> there. <laughs> and uh, here's a drawing of it, plan drawing. <clears throat> and here's Lincoln's drawings from the Rupert publication. And we have Lincoln's watercolors, line drawing and then uh, drawing, three-dimensional three drawing. Excellent work by, by uh, William Lincoln in Rupert's publication. And all, we're, all I'm adding is new photographs. And it's interesting what's missing. We have whole panels of stones missing now. I don't know where they are. I have no idea. And that's important information, or important to know that they're missing. So this is night photography of the same panels, again, missing facing stones. Where are they? And all three sides with the, with the feathered serpent and the stars, the star signs in this body of the serpent. So now we just, we have Lincoln's illustrations and the love photograph. That's the, that's the addition to the catalog is the new photographs. It's all important data. The Osario, this is important. We've all, most of us are familiar with the, the study that's been done on the inscriptions. 
and the date 998 Después de Cristo, after Christ. 998 after Christ is the date on this pillar, which is up here inside the temple at the top. It's the southeastern pillar of the four pillars on top. And we have this date, but what's what's fantastic to me is on the side on the side adjacent to this side we have a drawing with a non maya glyph on it unfortunately it's really hard to make out but thanks to Kowo's drawing it's this little figure here is one of the non maya glyphs over the head of this figure and this is on the same pillar as the date. So in essence, we have dated the non Maya glyphs to 998 AD. So that's pretty amazing. We have a date for the glyphs and it fits perfectly with the iconography of the, the Toltec iconography, the, the so-called, uh, what's it called? Uh, modified fluorescence or international style, or the Toltec, the Toltec iconography. I, I prefer to call it Western Mesoamerican rather than Toltec, but anyway, we have a date for at least one example of that glyph here at the, uh, in a plug for, for Megan's and my blog, one of our publications was, Bruce, was a Love and Reddick in which we revisited these dates again and uh, confirmed the 998 uh, AD date. So moving on. Now the temple of the uh, wall panels or retablos in Spanish here. And I, I had known about these forever, but it, I didn't. It didn't occur to me till fairly recently, till after I published the twenty, the twenty eleven uh, preliminary catalog, that we have them here too, and this is a again a new photograph, a nighttime photograph with side raking light, and down here at the bottom, this this is Rupert's rendition, which is basically a photograph that's colored in, so you can see it. Each one of these prisoners with their arms tied behind their backs has a feline glyph in front of their heads. So they all have the same glyph. Instead of, uh, you know, just, just when you think you understand the pattern of the naming where each figure has its own glyph, then you come across something that breaks the pattern, which is each one of these figures has the same glyph repeated over and over. So the same glyph, this feline head, repeats. And these are all captives. And here they are, uh, the photograph and the drawing. It, these aren't really drawings, they're Rupert's uh, colored in, so to speak, photographs to enhance enhanced photograph. So there's a different example, another example of non-Maya writing. And then we have what are only known because of Guillermo Coelho's field drawings that are in Peter Schmidt's field notes, which are in Peter Schmidt's house in Merida. And uh, two years ago, I spoke with uh, uh, Pepe Osorio who was at Riverside, UC Riverside at a conference. And he said that they are maintaining Peter's house as an archive for all, not only Chichen, but especially for all his Chichen archives. And he has shelves and shelves of field notes. And so uh, I, reminiscing of my fond, I have fond memories of spending evenings on Peter Schmidt's front porch and his wife, Peely, bringing us coffee, uh, you know, Nescafe, uh, and uh, with 
tablespoons of, of artificial creamer and sugar and uh, beaten, you know, whipped up to a, a foamy uh, mixture and then uh, cookies. And then Peter going into his house and coming out with these binders with Guillermo Colo's drawings, his field drawings, and allowing me to photograph them. And so we have further examples from the Stolop Temple, from the Phallos, which is in the initial series group, from the Atlantic, Atlantean columns, and then from way down south in the principal group of the Southwest, from two different buildings. And there are 17 glyphs from the uh, principal group of the Southwest building, building 5B16. We have 17 examples, thanks to Schmidt's field drawings. And also, and then eight more glyphs from the, also from the principal group of the Southeast, Southwest at a different building, building 5B19. And these are fallen blocks. These are fallen blocks on the ground. These columns are, are not restored yet. And so basically that's, that's a, a brief a rundown of, uh, of the glyphs. And here's the catalog that Megan put together. I mean, I supplied the, the material and Megan did this incredible job of uh, putting together the catalog uh, system, systematically. And we created our own catalog numbers. So we used the, uh, ac you know, we created like an acronym, basically just using the, uh, the initials, LTJ, Lower Temple of Jaguars. And then if it had figure numbers, like these are the figure numbers assigned by Mosley, D18 and D19, D20. These are the, no, excuse me. These are, wait a minute, let me go back up. Uh, where was I? Lower Temple of Jaguars. A, let's go down here. A3, at the bottom of the page, you see Lower Temple of Jaguars, A3, A4, A5. These are the, the figure numbers that are assigned by Maudsley. And then on the Eastern panel, up above where we had only Merle's rubbings, until 2019, and now we have photographs and drawings. We decided to just continue with Maudsley's numbering system. So where Maudsley left off at with a C, the C numbers on the north wall of the lower temple of Jaguars, then we continued then with D, and we numbered them D, so D18, D19, D20, etc. So anyway, that's our numbering system. And uh, in some cases where the, uh, like in the case of the uh, Southwest, uh, the uh, principal group of the Southwest, we don't have a name for the building. So we use the Carnegie designation 5B16, 5B19. And then we just numbered them in, in uh, taking off Schmidt's field notes. So anyway, that's a, this catalog system. And you can see the blue link that we, you click on the link and it'll take you to the page in the catalog. And these are, this is are just sample pages from the, uh, the back of the, at the, at the, at the end of the catalog in the appendix <laughs> is this catalog that Megan put together so well. And so after we're done with the PowerPoint, I'm gonna take you to the catalog itself and we can look through it, go backwards and forwards, up and down, just to sort of show you how, how it, the links work. And then we'll open it up for discussion or whatever. But in anticipation of our discussion, what can we read from the glyphs? I mean, although we can't read the glyphs, what can we infer from their presence, right? What can we infer that these glyphs appear? Now, Jeff Roswell and his gr group, uh, refining the chronology of Chichen Itza, <clears throat> points out that almost all academics that now work in the Northern Lowlands 
considered Chichen to have been a Maya site throughout its history, even throughout the 10th and 11th century, although the exact origin of the Itza continues to be a discussion theme. In other words, the idea of a long distance migration, which used to be in the days of, of uh, you know, Morley and Thompson and on up to today with uh, Coe and Houston proposing, proposing the, the Quetzalcoatl invasion of, of Chichen Itza, uh, which is, they're still proposing that, while most Mayanists don't want to accept that they were the, the foreign migration played that big a role. So it's sort of a dichotomy there. Uh, Ringel, you know, it represents the, the side that it's, they're really all, it's really all Maya. He says, even though he admits that, okay, there were external visitors, although external yeah, visitors may have been present, a decision to maintain a position of not rising but not a population replacement, but, but there was not a population replacement. So the extreme view would be that the Chichen Itza was replaced by foreigners. That's an extreme view. And I'm not sure anyone's really promoting that, but, but it is proposed that, the elite, that an elite group of warriors came in and either conquered or probably conquered or replaced the Maya leadership and set up this, uh, hierarchy with themselves at the top. But uh, those uh, that perhaps we can say that, and Bill's here in the audience, so I don't want to speak for him, but his writing speaks for him, uh, that the, the, the Maya were still the people, the agent of change. The Maya invited the external visitors in, and the Maya mediated the change to a Toltec ideology. So it was still the Maya that, that were in charge and the Maya that were doing the changing over to the Toltec ideology, Western Mesoamerican iconography. Somebody's unmuted somewhere. Anyway, for me, when I came across sailors, what Sailor wrote a hundred years ago, um, uh, I don't think anyone, I don't think I could have said this better. I mean, for sure I couldn't. I wouldn't put myself in the same class as Edward Saylor. I think this, to me, this is, uh, this says it all. The fact that these figures are named by miniature pictures introduced behind or above their heads is of striking significance. This so much resembles Mexican picture writing and is so different from what we see in Maya manuscripts and reliefs now known that this act, in my opinion, would alone be sufficient to assign these Chichen Itza reliefs and therewith this entire class of Chichen Itza edifices. In other words, the reliefs with the non-Maya glyphs, which are representative of the entire class of Maya buildings that were built at this time to a people descended from the Mexican or at least closely akin to them in culture. I, 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 I second Zaylor. That's my opinion. My personal opinion, <clears throat> these glyphs and these iconography are from the Itzas. These are the Itza people that came in at around, you know, in the 10th century, following Eric Thompson. I'm, I know I'm a Luddite. I, I still, uh, you know, I still hold on to a lot of what Eric Thompson said and give him extreme credit. Uh, I think they came from the Gulf Coast, the Chontal regions, where Nawa and Maya merge. That's where we have the Nawa and Maya merging in the Chontal area, the Gulf Coast. And this has been known for a long time. The Chicha, the Itza themselves say they came from Nono Walco, Nono Walco. Later, in the later centuries, the Shiu came from there. And it's interesting that the the final invasion and conquest of Yucatan came from there, it was staged by Montejo, the son, was staged from the Chontalpa, was staged from Cotzumalhuapa, uh, uh, and uh, with their central Mexican allies, they marched up, they, they 
took canoes up to Champoton and from Champoton marched overland up and invaded and conquered and settled in Merida and established Spanish rule. From the same, the same path, the same pattern as the Shu before them and the, and the uh, well, probably the Itzas before them. So I think that's the pattern. And probably the, uh, you know, the Teotihuacanos in the fourth century. Uh, anyway, so they invaded Yucatan, established their power. I think it's probably militarily because they're all shown with their, their spear throwers, their, their, their power signs of, of military power. They established their power center at Chichen Itza. They didn't, re, they didn't uh, replace the Maya. The Maya were still you know, 95% of the population, but the Itza were at the top. And they embarked on a tremendous construction program. They rebuilt the entire site from north to south. Imagine the, the wealth it would have taken to do such an enormous amount of construction of stone carving and stone building. The whole platform, the, the enormous central, central grand nivelacion, the central platform, in unbelievable amount of wealth and power to do that. This, these were the Esau, and that site was named after them and always known for them ever since. Completely changing the site in their own image. And with it, they introduced a new system of pictographic naming with some fanaticism appropriate for an international power center of religion, science, and commerce. So there you have it. Thank you very much for your attention. That's my presentation. Thank you, Bruce. Now, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure that uh, people are getting their questions in to the chat feature and that you know you can do that. Um, Bruce, on your map uh, of looking down on the Temple of the Warriors and, uh, and especially where the different locations were that you've encountered these glyphs, if you were standing on the Temple of the Warriors, to your right is another structure that appeared in your photo of the Temple of the Warriors on the left-hand side. Um, is that oh, the Temple yeah. of the Door Jams or something like that? Mesas, it's called Mesas. Temple of the Mesas. Well, years yeah. ago, I think it was Peter Smith took, took my group down to see the painted columns that are underneath that. And then, I mean, the colors are just seem to be so much more than what's surviving below the Temple of the Warriors now. But are you aware of that? Are there any glyphs down there? There are no glyphs on those. I am definitely aware of them. I have photographed them. And, uh, and um, compiled them into a uh, complete compilation along with the Chakmul pillars. So those are completely recorded, but not yet published. Huh. Well, and, they, and yes, they are amazing, the colors in there. And um, let's see, one uh, Maya Popovic is asking, what's the reason for the night photography? The reason for the night photography is to bring out the clearest details uh, when you do, uh, as, as Ian Graham has shown us, you know, you, you do a straight on portrait of the, of the, of the monument or the panel or the stela or whatever it is. And then you, you have the side, the, the light coming from the side at a, at a sharp raking angle. And that brings out the, uh, the relief the carving so that you can see the details. And, and I always like to add, it's, it's fascinating to me that when Charles Lindbergh flew over Yucatan to record the temples sticking up out of the jungle canopy, he would fly at dusk and dawn to get the side raking light from the sunrise mm -hmm. and the sunset 
And that's how he photographed the, the peaks of the pyramids coming out of the jungle canopy back in whatever year that was that Charles Lindbergh hmm. flew over Yucatan using the same principle of raking sidelight. And if you like, Lynn, you have to show the, uh, oh, go ahead. All right. No, you continue. I was going to show the catalog, but I'm, I'm not sure what I'm showing on my screen right now. I think I'm sure. Let me, uh, if I open up my catalog, do you see the front page of the non myoglyphs catalog now? Not yet. You still have the PowerPoint open. So okay. maybe uh, diminish that or make it a small icon and then now open your PDF. Now, do you have it now? Not yet. Are you screen sharing it? Oh, I forgot to click on screen share. Screen share. Screen share there. This should do it. Come on, there. Now you have it, right? Um, still the sand dune. Really? There it is. I clicked on. There it is. Yeah. Now do the hundred percent. Hundred percent. There. And I don't know if you all see each other in the Hollywood squares, but Megan, Megan, you want to raise your hand? Uh, if if your picture's up, I don't know. Megan. Put this catalog together. She's she's amazing. She's my co-publisher at uh, BruceLove.com. And so, uh, and this catalog is, as all our all our material on BruceLove.com is uh, open access for everyone to share internationally, any anywhere, anytime, without having to get written permission. Just you know, it's yours to share. And that's, the, I think that's the way it should be in our field. And people who hoard data are not doing anybody a favor. <coughs> so anyway, here's our catalog and an introduction. Let me just and say, uh, Megan is with us. I asked her to um, put on her video and I got a little message that Megan will share her video in a little while. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> she She's here with us. She's listening to us. So I just wanted to show how, you know, the, the how the catalog works. We can go how. So for instance, uh, Great Ball Court, GBCNT, Great Ball Court, North Temple, number one. And down at the bottom, you can you can click on appendix to the glyph catalog and you click on that and it links you to the catalog and there's the GBC North Temple number one. And then from there, if you want to click on the page number, you can click there and it takes you back to the page number. And then if you want, you can go back to the table of contents by clicking on table. So Megan put on all these links in, which makes it so <clears throat> easy to navigate through this thing. So for each Example for each building, I gave the Carnegie nomenclature, the Carnegie drawing when possible, and then a photograph where possible, and then a close up, and then the glyphs themselves. And then for each glyph, I gave all examples known. So here's Sheely and Matthew's drawing. Uh, here's Sheely and Matthew's drawing, Merle's rubbing. So in some cases, we have two or three examples of each, each glyph, uh, some cases just one example of each glyph. And in the catalog, we give all examples of each glyph. So if we went down to the catalog, you see if there's a drawing and a rubbing, you see both examples. If it's just one example, you see just that one example. In some cases, like, excuse me for scrolling through, uh, I was gonna there an example. There's four examples. There's there's a drawing, a rubbing, another drawing, and a photograph, and a and a watercolor. So that's that's just to show you the catalog, and you and it's 
all you're all welcome to have it to download it publish from it with you don't need to ask permission and uh just go to brucelove.com and there it is so I'd, i think i'm done now and i'd be happy to to talk to take questions um early on you might have elaborated that on this especially towards the end of your program but <clears throat> monet is asking you say non-maya but not toltec so will you give us your ideas who created them? Maybe if you could encapsulate the, that in like one, one paragraph. Well, the reason I say not Toltec is because in comparing them to Toltec, Toltec glyphs, the Toltec uh, pillars uh, at the temple at, at uh, Tula is they don't appear the same. Uh, the one uh, one glyph appears the same, the, the seated figure, but there's only six. There's only six examples from Tula on those pillars, and there's 260 in Chichen Itza. So I would say instead of saying they're Toltec, they're they're in the they're they're in the Western Mesoamerican tradition. They're in the tradition of other epiclassic slash post-classic. And there's a debate about whether or not they're epiclassic or post-classic. I, I like post-classic. I think they're post-classic. You know I mean, but I'm not an expert on archeology. span uh, I'm not as expert as some of the people in the audience here who know every stone and every C14 date that is ever produced. You know, I certainly don't, but I call it post-classic. And uh, they're Western, Meso so if they came from the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Coast is where all those, all that strong Western Mesoamerican influence was. And at the time of the Spanish invasion, there were the, the Pochteca were, were there from uh, Tenochtitlan, you know, poised to enter Yucatan through the Chontapa, through the Chontal region. That was the bottleneck through which all peoples came from central Mexico. And so there was strong, it's well known and well documented that there was very, very strong uh, Nawa influence in the uh, Gulf Coast region uh, throughout, throughout time. And that's where the Itzas came from who established their, their <laughs> reign over Chichen Itza. And I've, I've heard that the Itza stayed along the coast there by Chetumal for like as much as 260 years before they moved inland. Is, is that? Uh, well, in their chronicles, it, it, I, I really don't go by their chronicles in the Chilam Balams because, you know, all, all peoples, as, as Bill Ringel pointed out and others have pointed out, all Mesoamerican peoples create their own history. They create their mythology of their migrations. And it isn't necessarily historically accurate. It doesn't have to be historically accurate. It's what they create as their history. And, and that's what the Chilam Balam, and I think that's what you're referring to about, they spent so many hundred years, so many cartoons in, in Pole or, or in, yeah. you know, on the East Coast, and then they came there. And uh, it's all to be taken as, I think as created history. Yeah, there's even a sign I photographed that'll that says that that they stayed here for 260 years before they went to Chichen Itza. But um, yeah, let's see, that. Mateo Garcia is asking, could they have been a group of warriors that weren't important but dressed as jaguars when captured, or maybe they were captives of the jaguar warrior group? I don't know, I'm not an expert, but I'm very interested. I think he's speaking of the captives there. Uh, interesting question, yeah. Why were they, if they were captives, were they really warrior captives? Were they high ranking uh, Jaguar? I think, I guess you're probably talking about the Betablos where it shows the, the uh, captives each with a Jaguar glyph. Or the feline glyph. Right, you know, feline. Could ne not necessarily jaguar, it could be puma or, or whatever, but feline. Uh, 
Yeah, good question. Don't know, don't know the answer. And then uh, Jeffrey Braswell has some comments here. He ends up with Bravo, but uh, he adds, I'm not sure anymore that there were no foreigners at Chichen Itza. I just wanna put forward that the evidence for foreigners at Chichen is much stronger than any classic site with Teotihuacan influence. But honestly, I think we need to carefully rethink the extreme, it's Maya only, but don't quote him on that. <laughs> and he's asking- a, Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you, Jeff, and I, I'm flattered that you attended, and, and Bill Wrinkles here too. <laughs> we gotta put them up on no. the opposite side. <laughs> anyway, to uh, <laughs> great to have you. And uh, as Wrinkle points out, uh, we don't have archaeology of the of the uh, household groups of where's the barrio. If there was this Itza presence, we would have Itza barrios on the outskirts of Chichen, and we haven't. We don't have the archaeology of those settlements uh, yet, and that's sorely needed. I think Jeff and, and Bill would both agree on that. We need archaeology of, of the household groups and seeing if we find, if seeing what foreign, foreign, in, foreign artifacts we find there. You want to say anything, Jeffrey? Okay. I guess not. Um, but he does ask, does anyone have details regarding Augustine Peña's Toltec warrior burial at Chichen Itza. It might have been dug around 91, 92. Have you heard of that, Bruce? No. Hmm. Oh. Hello, Jim. Jim? Yes? Yeah. Just a little word quickly. Uh, from our studies that is up over many years, the uh, beginning dates there pushing back to 600 BC. And uh, evidence is showing their migrations through time and reaching up into Mexico and then in the late classic, that Mexican influence moving back along the Gulf Coast and up the Usumacinta River back into Guatemala, and this whole period shows a, uh, a purple view, even though it's late, that uh, the investiture uh, of the purple view during that late period was being sent up to Northern Yucatan to receive their uh, authority and investiture to bring back home into Highland Guatemala. And that influence coming out of the Gulf Coast, we've, we're finding a lot of evidence of it spreading on down the Pacific Coast in, in, into that Southern territory. But uh, I think there's a good, good influence for uh, a, a lot of world speculation, maybe still, but uh, I think that has some significance. Thank you, Garth. Thank you, Garth. Um, let's see, John uh, Diago says it's an important and awesome presentation and that George Stewart would be so proud. Thanks to Bruce wow. and Megan for all this work. And uh, let me see, we down to the last one. Uh, there's a tremendous variation in the structure of the non-Maya glyphs some contain cartouches, cartouches, others don't. The sequence and placement of bar and, not, bar and dot numerals vary. Uh, some bars are wrapped in the manner of uh, Xochicalco writing system. So in a cosmopolitan city, why does this writing necessarily represent one Mesoamerican script? Okay. Well, my answer is that it is Chichen script. 
and that is the that is a script invented by and adapted by the rulers of Chichen Itza. And so it is Chichen script, just like Kakashla is Kakashla script. And, and the others that this, the, the reviewer just mentioned uh, are in the Tula script and the other epi-classic, post-classic scripts of, of Mexico are given are named by their sites so why not name this script by its site by Chichen Itza so this is Chichen Itza writing yeah. in my opinion and uh, Jeffrey agrees and he said whatever the source is this is essentially an invention at Chichen Itza and it took more than a hundred years to develop roughly from 900 to uh, a thousand in the common area <laughs> Um, and Annabeth says, good point about the multiple script styles. And the, uh, these were mariners who contacted a lot of people. Yes, I think we need to remember the economic aspect of mariners, the, the, the powerhouse, and I put that in my statement, it's a religious powerhouse and a military powerhouse and an economic powerhouse, those three together. So the, the speaking of trade, so you would, you would expect to find a more international type script at a, at a trade center, an economic powerhouse, a Tolan, as Bill Ringo so well pointed out, this is a Tolan from the post-classic or epi-classic period. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's not forget the ec economics of it. The, the imagine the wealth it took to build such an enormous site at that time. And uh, Jeffrey says maybe they were borrowing from other sites, from Tula to uh, Cosmaguapa, but this writing system came together at Chichen, as Bruce has shown. Uh, Megan's chiming in. She's here, but her video is not working at all. So we won't be able to, we'll be able to wave, but she won't be able to wave to us. <laughs> And Annabeth says, so, great uh, point, Jeff. Uh, Chichen was the melting point that attracted these folks and blended them together. Uh, Fabian says, great presentation, Bruce. Is there any correlation for the age of the carvings with the architectural structure sequence at the buildings at Chichen? I think you they're, they're the one and the same. They're one and the same. The carving, as, as Sailor pointed out, the, the carvings and the buildings that they that they're on, they're one and the same. The modified fluorescent uh, or international style or Toltec style or Western Mesoamerican style carvings and buildings. That was an enormous building program that yeah. covered the almost entire site. And if if excuse me for going on too long, but. I just remembered something, a very important point to bring out is that the Maya, the traditional Maya writing continued to be uh, available and would continue to be used into this period. So it was used at the same time, such as we have on the pillar on top of the Osario, we have the Maya script with a double date and uh, on one side in the non-Maya script on the adjacent side of the same pillar, that's not the only place we get it. We also get the, the uh, so-called sacrificial stone or ball court marker that George Stewart published years ago, Linnea Wren published in George Stewart's series uh, that has Toltec iconography with Maya glyphs. We also have the Maya glyphs at the uh, the temple of the uh, principal group of the Southwest Old Castillo, Castillo Viejo, which is published in uh, Joel Skidmore's amazing series, the Fari Journal. The, uh, the, uh, the Maya glyphs there. And what's fascinating about those glyphs is that the, you have uh, Toltec iconography, you have Maya glyphs, classic Maya glyphs, but in but reading the glyphs, 
they, they have a, the name glyphs in the central Mexican style in the sense that eight Akbal is a name of the Lord. So the Lord is named with a calendar name and naming by calendar name is a, is a trait of Western Mesoamerican uh, naming. So you have naming with a Maya calendar, eight Akbal on a building of the, you know, modified fluorescent or international style. And you have the classic Maya writing all coming, all combined. And Evan Albright makes an interesting comment. He goes, have you read La Casa Real de Cocom, uh, the history of the Yucatan? And that the Mex Mexicanized glyphs on the pillars on the upper temple of the jaguar appear to correspond to the name title of the Cocones. I have seen that article by uh, Peter Biro and right. Eduardo and Pérez. Pérez, uh, Juan Perez de Heredia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've seen it, I've read it. I'm I'm not buying it yet, but I think it's <laughs> intriguing. Uh, I don't think it's like trying to decipher a, a writing system when you don't have enough examples to decipher it. Uh, yes, I can see how these signs match name signs. And I think it's important that they point this out. And, and I thank them both for pointing this out. Yeah. And I consider myself being a, a colleague in good standing with both these folks. So uh, keep on publishing, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hold this we'll hold this up as a, as a strong possibility at this point. And uh, C. Wiley says that at El Tahin, uh, he and Rex Kuntz, Kuntz, Kuntz. have independently mm -hmm. identified named lists from two different classic Veracruz scripts. Great. And that's, I'm sure it's, if it's published, it should be published. Uh, you can put in the chat the publication citation, or, or most of us, most, most uh, academics here in the audience already know about it if it's published. Mm -hmm. So thank and, you for that. That's important. You know, Rex does good work there, and of course. And Annabeth uh, Hidrick says, "Really wonderful work, and the generosity of you sharing your work freely is so commendable." And uh, from there, uh, Jeffrey has his hand up. Why don't you uh, say a few things, Jeffrey? Unmute yourself. You got to unmute. Uh, I'm asking him. Okay, I'm sorry. I've had trouble with this all day long. I hope I hope you can hear me. And I've, I've actually tried to fix this. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce, for a wonderful presentation of such amazingly important work. And thank you for um, acknowledging Peter Schmidt, who really deserves huge acknowledgement for, for this work of this great project that you were part of and I've been part of, you know, going back to the last millennium. Um, he was a great soul. Um, we had a wonderful talk and I've, I've sort of been thinking about it in my COVID brain for the last few days since we talked. And um, I hope you don't mind me going through some chronological issues and I'll take the blame as I wrote, if, if, if you don't agree. Um, but there seems to be a sequence and you've really helped me see this. The first part of it is foreign names or styled names in Mayan glyphs. And you uh, found them in the Southwest group, the principal group of the Southwest with your, your Akbal dude, right? Um, so they're written in Maya glyphs, but that's, that's not a classic style name. And that's around 900. And then in the mid 900s, we get 
two that I'm aware of crazy texts that appear with non-Maya iconography, whatever you want to call it, modified, modified fluorescent iconography, I like. Um, one is the ball court stone or round stone or whatever. The other is that, um, that unknown tomb capstone, which has Maya glyphs and quote unquote Toltec imagery, whatever you want to call it. And that, that's probably in the mid 10th century. And then as you wonderfully pointed out, we have two examples of both scripts or whatever you want to call them, both writing systems together circa um, circa 1000 AD. One is on the Osadio and the other is in um, uh, Temple of the Chakmuls. So at that point, almost a hundred years later, we have the two writing systems together. And then finally in the, in the last um, constructions, and you know, Bill and I are gonna argue for the rest of our lives about when they date to, I think they're post 1000, but probably not by too much. Uh, the ball court, the, the, the warriors, whatever, the Mayan script is gone on um, carved monuments. Of course, we know it's, it's going on on paper somewhere, right? Because we still have that for hundreds of years later. So um, what I really have learned from you is this, and put it together with the chronology of the site, if there's this development, this writing system, which I, I really agree with you and Peter so much, it's the Chichen writing system. It develops and it starts to develop maybe a little with naming ideas before the artwork comes in. Then the artwork comes in in the 10th century, middle of it. And then there's a transition, at least on monuments, away from quote unquote Mayan writing to the CI system. Um, that's how I see it. And that's, you know, we talked about this. I don't know if I convinced you. I don't, uh, um, but I, I, I think there's such great evidence that you've shown that it took a hundred years for all this to take place, this whole process. And that's part of this notion that it's gotta be Chichen writing, right? It, it developed there. It isn't just like suddenly overnight it, it appears. It, we see it in writing for names, changing and naming conventions. We see it, the two systems together on two examples, not robust, but two. And then we see the old system, at least on stone disappearing. Um, so I've learned so much from talking to you in the last week. I'm gonna sign off. I hope I didn't go on too long. Thank you. All right. Um, Catherine Shurik had a question about, it was very early when you were showing a dog and she was asking, could that be an example of grass out in front of the dog? I don't know. Yeah, I, I like that. It could be two, it could be two syllables or two, two logograms mm -hmm. put together. Uh, I hadn't thought of it as grass, but I, I didn't know. I didn't, couldn't think of anything else. Yeah. I, I was wondering if it was like a millipede or something, like a dog, <laughs> a dogapede. And she just a said it, it, it could have been to emphasize the size of the dog, the dog being small. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. It's more likely a local graphic. Mm -hmm. And then Annabeth, uh, says one thing to consider is central Mexican traditions like Teotihuacan seem to have lots of nouns and names as the emphasis rather than sentences. So in all, the Chichen script may have a lot of central Mexican affinities. Well, for sure. That's what I've been saying. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey's totally excited, but he's got to go. And he says, <laughs> uh, Bruce is really breaking ground here. <laughs> no. Well, like, like they say, it's amazing what data can do to a, how data can mess up a good theory. <laughs> All 
All right. But I'm open. I, I love. I open. A, I'm open to conversation with anyone anytime, and I'm very happy to have yep. fostered a conversation. And remember the uh, if you've got your copy of the Atlander uh, number three, it's a direct link to the catalog at at brucelove.com. Um, also. In that issue are direct links to Michael email or my email, <clears throat> but I mentioned some people asked early on about when when will the recording appear, and I said a few days after the event it'll appear on YouTube. But for anybody who's not already on our subscriber lists for the Atlander, please send me your email. It's Maya Man at bellsouth.net and um we'll get you i'll you know personally send you the notice on when we have the recording up but it was great to see everybody here with us a uh, very interesting subject bruce and uh is there anything else from anybody all right then thank you bruce and let's uh let it let's end it here Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Jim. Good job. Thank you, Bruce. Very good. Hey, Chile says thanks, Bruce. And so thank you. John, thank you. Hi. <laughs> thanks, Megan. <laughs> oh, she's here. <laughs> thanks, Jim, Where's very much for your help, too. Oh, yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Bruce. I'm Mary. Good night. Hi, Pat. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi, everybody. There's Mary Lou. Hello, Mary Lou. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's, let's end it there. Thank you, everybody, and especially thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Be in touch. Adios. <laughs>